Hi everyone, I'm going to introduce you the work Power Analysis on Shoe Prime. I'm Wei Long Huang, and the other two authors are Dr. Jim Peng Chen and Dr. Bo Ying Yang. We come from Academia Seneca, Taiwan. I'll first introduce post quantum cryptography and Shoe Prime, then, after a brief review about experiment settings and power analysis methods in our paper, I'll talk about the features in our three single trace attacks. In the finale, I'll list some other implementations that are potentially subject to our methods. Enterprise. Short algorithm can efficiently solve integer factorization and discrete algorithms, and functional quantum computers are estimated as arriving in 10 to 20 years. Therefore, NIST initiated its post quantum cryptography standardization project in 2016. The submissions include key encapsulation mechanisms and digital signatures. We can categorize the hundreds of assumptions behind into lattices, error correcting codes, multivariate quadratic equations, supersingular isogeny, hash functions, and some others. Here, we target Enterprise and that is based KEM. It contains two KEM algorithms, Streamline Enterprise and Entry L prime. Each has three parameter sets, characterized by the polynomials inside, 653, 761, and 857 coefficients, respectively. In this slide, we use Streamline Enterprise 761 decapsulation as our target implementation. R here refers to the integer polynomial ring modulo x to p minus x minus 1. Over q and over 3, the coefficients come from Gaul field q and Gaul field 3 respectively. A polynomial is small if it is ternary and is furthermore short if it has exactly w non zero coefficients. Streamline Enterprise is characterized by p, q, and w, d three parameters. Public key H and Cybertech C are two general polynomials of P coefficients from Gaulfield Q. In contrast, session key R and public key F are short, so they have only W coefficients, 1 or minus 1. We are interested in multiplications between our key element and the short polynomial. The first element can be Cybertext or public key, so we know it. The second input can be session key or public key, so we want it. The target implementation here uses process scanning to fulfill its multiplications. So the store operations to the upper array are minimized as we compute one upper coefficient at a time. It is clear in this diagram that the most sectional informative part is the calculation of the middle upper coefficient. Such multiplications in our queue appear not only in decapsulation but also in encapsulation and the key generation of entry L prime. A brief preview. We run our target implementations in C and ARM assembly on Cortex M4. Triple wide two power version helps generate random inputs and measure the target's power consumption. Then we run the statistical analysis programs in Python 3.6 and C on a MacBook Air to analyze power traces. Here is the photo of our measurement setup. Here are the four power analysis methods in our paper. And their features. Three of them are single trace attacks. Correlation power analysis, vertical versus horizontal in depth. Vertical CPA observes only the most sectional formative part in the publication, and that's the calculation of the middle output coefficient. The target implementation loads input coefficient pairs from the lowest degree to the highest degree of the coefficients we know, say, semitext coefficients. So we reveal secret coefficients, say perfect key coefficients, from the highest degree to the lowest degree. The intermediate state, the current value of the middle upper coefficient, changes only if the current perfect key coefficient is non-zero. So we look for such changes throughout the calculation, reveal the positions and values of all the non-zero perfect key coefficients, and thus recover the entire perfect key. It is worth noting that the non-zero perfect key coefficients of the two highest degrees should be revealed. Should be together revealed. If we would like to reveal that of the highest degree solely, then we probably cannot discern the change in upper coefficient value from the load operation of the corresponding separate text. As for the, non, the other non-zero perfect key coefficients, we just reveal them one at a time. In Vertical CPA, we compute the ideal power sample sequence from the intermediate variable, the same intermediate variable across different inputs. 
and then we compare it with its real-world counterpart at the same timing across different executions. So can we squeeze more information from its short trace? The answer is yes. In DEF CPA, we compute the ideal power sample sequence from different intermediate variables from one single input. Now its real-world counterpart is from different timings in one single execution. In both scenarios, one timing, one intermediate variable, and one intermediate variable, seemingly one perfect coefficient to recover. So why would the in-depth CPA make a difference? Each intermediate state of the middle upper coefficient depends on both the current input coefficient pair and all the previously loaded input coefficient pairs. So one intermediate state helps more than reveal one new perfect coefficient. It can meanwhile verify the correctness of all the previously revealed perfect coefficients. To exploit this dependence, we use the extend and prune framework. Here is an example. We like to reveal 67 perfect coefficients at a time. So we recursively generate each 67 coefficient hypothesis. A perfect coefficient can only be 1, 0, or minus 1. So the number of candidates steadily triples. Whenever the current hypothesis has six new coefficients, we calculate correlation between power sample sequences. If the correlation fails to cross the fixed threshold, then we discard the current hypothesis right away. That's how we get the vertical drops and the multiples of six, and slow down the exponential increase of the candidates to test. Unfortunately, some perfect coefficients at the end of the block may go wrong. In the current block recovery, they are related to very few intermediate states, so they can lead to better correlation due to the noise. In the next block recovery, the initial intermediate state must be wrong. So no hypothesis, not even the correct one, can lead to a good correlation. No survivors, and epic fail. Luckily, no survivors in the current block recovery also signals the tail errors in the last block recovery. And we can roll back by half a block to correct these tail errors. They are now right in the middle of the current new block. Here is a toy example. Each block contains five coefficients. Can they printing every two new coefficients? So we recursively generate the first element, the second, then k the pruning, the third, the fourth, then k the pruning, the fifth. Here, we choose the best five coefficient survivor as our optimal guess. However, if we make a mistake at the fifth, then the second block recovery yields no results. That would trigger the rollback mechanism. And now the third block recovery is meant to calculate tail error. What if we observe more than one upper coefficient calculation? In in-depth CPA, candidate printing can be ineffective because each M coefficient block corresponds to only M power samples. Very many wrong hypotheses, their prefixes, can still fit the few power samples quite well. So overall, the in-depth CPA can be inefficient and even inaccurate. But we can learn from horizontal attacks and observe some near the middle upper coefficient calculations. These upper coefficients have almost as many intermediate states as the middle upper coefficient. Therefore, if we observe L minus one more upper coefficient calculations, we have almost L times as many data. Here's a real world example. We observe five upper coefficient calculations rather than one. So the canyon printing is now effective. Only 42 hypotheses of 67 coefficients survives in the top block recovery. Unfortunately, there is one tail error. So the middle block recovery has no survivors. And the rollback mechanism now gets triggered. The third block recovery, the bottom block recovery, is meant to correct this tail error, and it succeeds. Online template attacks. If the power characteristic of the target device fails to fit simple power models well, we need some template traces to profile the characteristic. These template traces come from a fully controlled device, similar to a target device. Classical template attacks need many template traces and heavy computational power to compute the multivariate Gaussian power model. So can we complete the profiling stage with just few template traces? The answer is yes. 
In online template attacks, we acquire the single target trace first. We then partition this target trace into p pieces. Each piece corresponds to one multiply and accumulate. Then we start to generate three template traces for the first perfect key coefficient recovery. They indicate the perfect key coefficient to be 0, 1, and minus 1. Online template attacks would then compare the first piece of the target trace with each of the three template traces. The closest template trace in terms of Euclidean distance gives us our optimal guess. We then update this guess to our knowledge, and according to this knowledge, start to generate the next three template traces for the second perfect key coefficient recovery, and so on. So can we build the templates we need with fewer template traces? The answer is still yes, and here is the chosen input variant of online template attacks. We set the inverse ciphertext to have p identical coefficients. Now each intermediate state is a multiple of c sub 0 modulo q. Since all in w non zero perfect coefficients, 1 and minus 1, are randomly distributed, we need much fewer template traces to mount an attack. Here is an example. It only needs 60 template traces. The blues are the cases where the perfect coefficient is 0. The greens on the right, the perfect coefficient is 1. The reds on the left, the perfect coefficient is minus 1. Each triplet of red, blue, and green is for a certain multiple of c sub 0 modulo q. If the template generator further accepts legitimate perfect keys, then we can set the f star to be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on, or 0, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 1, and so on. We then set the ciphertext c star as the input ciphertext, except that c star sub 1 can be c sub 0, or c sub 0 times minus w, border q. Now we only need four template generator executions to build all the templates we need. Chosen input simple power analysis. There are two commonly used countermeasures for intro like crypto systems. The first is to randomly initialize every and each output coefficient. Then at the end of the each output coefficient calculation, we subtract this random offset from the result. The second is to randomly access the input coefficient pairs during each output coefficient calculation. Unfortunately, both countermeasures are ineffective when the adversaries can choose the input text. As an introductory example, we start with countermeasure 2. Here, we choose the input text to be constant c sub 0 and observe the output coefficient calculation of degree p 0 to p minus 1. First, we partition this long single power trace into p pieces. Then, if the perfect coefficient of degree i is non-zero, the corresponding i-th piece of a single long power trace will be discontinuous. There are only two kinds of discontinuities because there are only two possible values of non-zero perfect coefficients, 1 and minus 1. As for the chosen input as pa on countermeasure 1, it is a bit more complicated. Its first stage resembles the introductory example, but here we only care if the piece is continuous or discontinuous. After the first stage, we know the degrees of all the non-zero perfect key coefficients. Now we can start the second stage. The second stage is back to the calculation of the middle upper coefficient. Suppose now we know that fj1 and fj2 are non-zero. We would like to know if fj1 and fj2 are equal. We can set the limit ciphertext c such that only c sub 0, only c sub p minus 1 minus j1 and c sub p minus 1 minus j2 are non zero. They are identical. So now we expect two discontinuities and three patterns in each short trace. If the first pattern and the last pattern are the same, then fj1 is minus fj2. Otherwise, fj1 is equal to fj2. At the end of the chosen input as pa, whether on counter major 1 or on counter major 2, we need and we exploit the error detection mechanism of n2 prime to choose from the two final hypotheses. Finally, we've also experimented our power analysis methods on the optimized product scanning. In this optimized version, 
we do not call model reductions until the very end of each upper coefficient calculation. Also, we use an SMD instruction, SMLADX, to replace SMLBB. This instruction completes to multiply and accumulate at the time. Now, online template attacks fail because it relies on a certain amount of sanctional leakage available. In contrast, chosen input SPA and horizontal index CPA remains effective because they only target certain leaky power samples. We recommend first order masking with both inputs masked as the counter measure. If we do not mask the separate text, then the publication is directly subject to horizontal correlation power analysis. If we do not mask the perfect keys, then the publication is potentially subject to SPA or other profiling attacks. To summarize, we propose three single trace power analysis methods against product scanning. We apply them to the reference optimized and protected implementations. Here, we use streamlined entry prime decapsulation as the concrete target, but overall, entry prime decap and cap and a key generation of entry L prime contain the operation of interest. Our methods may work for other ideal lattice crypto if their secret coefficients also come from a small set of possibilities. As for other ideal or advanced modifications, our methods may apply to the multi-level Karazuba, ending with plus scanning. Thank you for your listening.